When it comes time to understanding how production works, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that it's not necessarily linear or constant to say that if I hire one worker, he's going to produce this amount of t-shirts in a given time period. If I hire a second one, it's going to be double, a third one triple, a fourth one quadruple. If they're all the same, kind of all twins, all the same uh, education, all the same productivity, it's not true that the more I hire people, uh, it's going to follow this fixed pattern. That's not what we would normally expect. In certain instances, it might be the case. But in other cases, there's other things that come into play, and those things are very important. So to highlight this for now, we're just going to look at a very simple production function, which represents a certain uh, relationship between quantity of input. In this case here, the input that we're going to use, let's just think about it as the amount of labor we have. So labor for people, uh, this is the amount of workers that we have. Quantity of output could be the amount of t-shirts produced in a given time period. We have our average product and we'll also have our marginal product. We'll come back to calculating average product. Uh, we have an actual slide for it, but uh, essentially average product is simply dividing uh, the total production of output divided by the amount of workers. In this case here, I divide 40 by 1, I get 40. 90 by 2, I get 45. 120 by 3, 40. 140 by 4, 35, and so on. So you can see that the average production of the group of workers is not necessarily constant. I don't have a constant 40 all the way through. So let's look at what would marginal product be. Well, what is marginal product? It's the extra production level I would get going from 0 to one worker, what's that extra production level? Well, I was producing zero units, now I've produced 40, so by hiring one worker, that first worker has produced 40 units. If I go from one to two, okay, it's easier to see it if I go this way instead, but if I go from one to two, I have a situation that the second worker brings me an extra 50 units. Two to three, well, I had 90 units. If I hire that third person, I'm going to get an extra 30. If I hire an extra one, I'll get an extra 20. And if I hire an extra one, I'll get an extra 10. So you can see that this changes quite dramatically over time. Even though the average didn't drop that much, we could see that initially the extra workers make for a big difference in the output quantity but over time that output does not increase so much so why would we expect to see this situation and if i were to draw this out so let's say i have zero to five workers and zero to 150 i could set up a total product curve so i'll have my labor down here zero to five and I know I go up to 150, this is my output. So I have this point here. If I were to look at the other points, uh, one and 40, two and 90, three and 120. So here, if I just set it up quickly, this would be 100, 50, one, two, three, four, five. So one and 40, I would have this point here. 2 and I said and 90 this point 3 and 120 I'd be somewhere over here 4 and 140 I'd be over here so you could see that this has this kind of shape that goes up steep and then it flattens out ideally I'd be going through these points but I'm going in this situation here so this is my total product curve So it shows the relationship between labor and the total product or my output level. So here it picks up and then it flattens out. Okay. So why is it, why is the productivity picking up initially? Why do I have this situation? Well, the easy way to explain this situation is if you imagine going to Subway or going to a pizza shop and only having one worker. How many 
subs can this person pump out and sell? Well, if there's only one worker at the subway, you think this worker's gonna have to take the order, take out the bread, put the veggies, then move on to the meats, and then have this person pay, and then do it all over again. They might do it by steps, but you could think the step of uh, simply uh, getting the food prepared versus the step of having the person pay. Well, one of these steps, they need to wear gloves. One of these steps, they won't be wearing gloves. So this running around process is very time consuming and very wasteful. So for, with very low workers, yeah, and this is dependent on the scenario that we're in, with very little workers, we have wasteful running around. So this person is just running around from one station to the other. So when we add this extra worker, it's booming this productivity. It's gone like the second worker is more productive than the first one, even though the first one had access to all the tools, the second one's more productive. So initially we have some sort of specialization. Specialization helps out. So in that situation, what we mean by specialization is this idea that uh, you should be the one in charge of potentially taking orders, veggies, uh, maybe uh, even meats or something else, or I could be the one uh, having people pay, taking orders, and so on and so forth. And you set, try to set it up that it flows nicely and that's always someone is working, but there's not much wasteful time between the individuals. So you set it up in a way that specialization helps out. So you have that happening, and you'd have that happening in most uh, restaurants or different types of businesses where this kind of idea of specialization helps out. If you think of uh, Henry Ford and his first kind of production line, it's based on the specialization idea. However, in this short time framework, because in chapter seven so far, we're just looking at this is production decisions we have today or tomorrow. We don't have a massive time work. We're limited, we're confined to a certain space. So if you think of a subway, I could have a couple workers, but let's say we look at the subway in Lennoxville or the Quiznos on campus, there's a limited amount of space. So the third worker is gonna add a certain productivity and the amount of subs or that we could pump out the fourth one as well, but over time, it's gonna taper off that even if you hire more people, it's not necessarily becoming more productive. Those extra people are maybe just taking out the trash, going to get some ingredients if some are needed. It's uh, very unproductive. So we have this situation here of what we will get to know as diminishing marginal product of labor. Marginal product, diminishing marginal product is the biggest idea here, but because we're talking about the production of labor, that's why I put marginal production of labor. So this is the situation that we have from our previous example. And this is the situation that you'll always encounter that you have one part specialization. So one part that focuses on specialization and the latter part is gonna be about diminishing marginal product of labor. When looking at this production function, a few things have to be kept in mind. As I mentioned before, we're dealing with the short term, which means that there is only one variable here that we're varying. And most instances, this would be the truth. So here, the only input that we have that is varying is labor. Because if you have a subway and you're running this, uh, this business, uh, the only thing you could do if you expect a lot more customers to come in the next day is to hire more people. You could have or have more of your workers come in all on the same day. But to say that uh, you're going to expand double the size of your location, very unlikely. Or to even say we're going to have access to uh, more ovens and different things like that on a very short term basis may be very hard to do so. Um, so this would be the case for a situation such as Subway. But in other situations, you might have businesses that on the other hand, it's very easy to rent an extra machine or to rent something else, but to find 
qualified trained labor in a very short term situation is very hard. So in those instances, they would look at how could an increase in capital have an impact on production? And what would be my marginal productivity of my capital in that case? In most instances in this class, we're just going to focus on changing the amount of labor. So we're going to treat capital here as fixed because we're undertaking the short run analysis where we treat capital as fixed and labor as variable. But like I mentioned, it could be the opposite. When it comes to uh, this, we, we already calculated on the first table. The two main components of productivity are marginal product of labor and average product of labor. If I look at the calculation of each of them, it's very similar. In both of these instances, I have my Q divided by my L, Q divided by my L. But here, this little triangle for the people that don't remember what this triangle means, means a change in. So now <clears throat> let's look at the difference between these two graphically. So to do so, we're just going to take the numbers we had previously in this diagram here, and we're going to plot it on a graph. One thing to note, though, is that you will notice that for input levels like one, two, three, four, five, I will have an average productivity associated to uh, the number five and so on. Whereas marginal productivity, because it happens between zero and one workers, between one and two workers, two and three, and so on and so forth, I'm going to have a situation where that dot will be in between the two. So let's start representing this. So my highest productivity from marginal or average is 50. So I'm going to just set up the graph first. been a little bit better. Um, let's just uh, so now I have my tables, which will represent my marginal productivity of labor, average productivity of labor for different labor levels. Let's just try to remember a few of these. So for uh, input 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I have 40, 45, 40, 35, 30. So 40, 45, 40, 35, 30. If I link these up, it's not perfect, but it gives me a general idea of what the average productivity of labor curve would look like. If I then take the information for marginal productivity of labor, I have 40, 50, 30, 20, 10. It goes here. So in between zero and one, I have 40. Let's set it up in green. Actually. I have 40. And I have in between one and two, I'll have 50. And then I have over here, I have 30, 20, and 10. This is my marginal productivity of labor. One thing we can notice from this graph, and if you were to do the same example, just change the numbers around, calculate uh, change the output levels around, calculate marginal productivity of labor, average productivity of labor, and you were to graph it, you would notice that uh, MPL will pretty much cross average product of, of labor always on the top section. If this was done perfectly, it would be always on the, the maximum point, and there is a very specific reason for this. So this is not just uh, by chance that it's crossing at its top section of APL, it actually always will be the case. So let's try to understand why and we're going to come back to this graph. 
For the previous graph and many other graphs, we will have this relationship, which states that at any level of labor, when marginal productivity is greater than the average productivity, therefore the average productivity must be increasing. When marginal productivity is smaller than the average productivity, average productivity must be decreasing. And marginal productivity will always meet average productivity at its maximum. If we think about the graph we had here, this is the case. When marginal productivity was above average productivity, average productivity was increasing. When it's somewhere below, we see that average productivity is falling and it crosses at its maximum point. An easy way to understand this concept I find is by using the idea of uh, looking at a student's average. So if we look at a student's average and we say, well, at the end of the term, the, the grades start rolling in. So you start looking up on uh, your uh, MyBU profile and you start seeing that in marketing, you got 60% in management, you got 70% and in math, you got 80. Well, I take in the current average of that and that would give you an average grade of 70%. Well, what would happen if you're marginal, you're your last grade that you obtain, you're obtaining an extra one in that last grade is a grade of 90 in economics. Well, what will happen? That last additional mark is greater than your current average. Therefore, it must be bringing up your average. It's the same thing with marginal and average productivity. If that last worker you hire is more productive on his own, has a higher uh, productivity per person, let's say, than the current average in the past, it's gonna bring up the average. It's gonna make all the other workers seem more productive. It's gonna bring the total uh, productivity up and the average productivity up. However, if this last person that you hire, everyone else was producing on average 30 pizzas and you hire this last person who only produces 10, well, obviously, the amount of pizzas produced is still going up, yes, but the average is getting pulled down. Same idea here that applies. So this relationship between average productivity and marginal productivity will always hold. There's no reason uh, rationally that this could not hold. Okay. So we're going to move on to the cost functions, and we're going to notice that between production functions and cost functions, there's a strong link. But for the purpose of this class, it's going to be more the cost functions, which will be extremely important when we move on to chapters 9, 10, and 11, analyzing the different market structures, um, quantity decisions, and uh, how do they maximize their profits. So this is the basis for cost function, which we will see next.